Ah, there we are, getting started. Okay, um, this is the last of uh, um, the lectures I want you to be thinking about when it comes to making arguments. And our goal in this lecture is we're not going to be looking at documents themselves and saying, well, what are the arguments that the authors are using? Instead, we're going to be trying to mobilize arguments um, for making you know, arguments to your friends and family and all of that kind of stuff, okay? So this is very important for your final exam, where I want to see you using the philosophical tools to move through some of our policy paper debates, okay? All right, remember our chart, right? So this is the big chart. Uh, on the left side here going down, we have philosophical liberalism and philosophical republicanism. And then across the top, we have Democratic Party and Republican Party, okay? And they, you know, we've gone over this before. Here's the labels for you. Remember, these are our four sort of basic political positions that combine our philosophy with our actual political parties. If we're in a, a you know, parliamentary single member, uh, parliamentary system with um, uh, proportional representation, parties and ideology would overlap much more tightly. Not perfectly so, but definitely would overlap much more tightly. Okay, there are two kinds of basic rights. We've gone over this, prob usually I go over this in class a little bit, um, but it's important to keep these in mind. We have positive and negative rights. Positive rights are things the government has to provide to you, like an education, right? Um, other things the government provides as a lawyer if you can't afford one, right? There's lots of things the government, we think, you know what, the government is obligated to provide these things to me. Negative rights are protections, things that the government cannot do, protections. So a positive right is a right to something, the government has to give me X. A negative right is a right from something. The government cannot force me to do X, cannot do X without my consent. That's the type of sort of logic here. And both liberals and, make, and Republicans make arguments in favor of both of those, these things. It's not liberals are one way and Republicans are another. They're both doing both of these things. So let's look at how um, a basic positive right from a liberal sort of way of thinking. In order to be a person with the use of reason, it is necessary that the government provide blank, and then fill in the blank. So things that generally, or in this case, definitely go into the blank, secular and scientific education. So remember, liberals here are wary of religion, especially in education, because it encourages people to look for other answers to questions other than the free use of reason, right? Well, the, the priest said so. That to a liberal, that's definitely not allowed. I mean, um, you know, and I think you can understand why that could be problematic. Now, what about something like basic social services? So education definitely comes out very highly. I think, you know, to be a person with the use of reason, if you're not given education, um, we might not say you're not going to automatically have some you know, ability to use reason, uh, but it certainly can be a big hindrance on, on your ability to do so. Uh, so, but then what about basic social services? Can being hungry or homeless affect your ability to use reason? Uh, excuse me. And the answer seems to be that at least sometimes yes, right? I mean, you, start, you don't have a right to McDonald's every day or something like that. But if you don't have a way to actually earn a living, and not under your own fault, but there's just not enough jobs to go around or something like that, which by the way, there are not enough jobs to go around, just isn't, it's never happened, okay? Never, ever, ever has it happened where everyone has a job. World War II, okay, fine. So we had all the men, you know, fighting a big war in Europe, and then the women step in and do, and you know, and everyone's working. That's the only time we've come to actual full, close to even actual full employment. Okay, so it's not your fault. You're one of those five, seven, eight percent of people who can't get a job. What are you gonna do? Not eat, right? That's not gonna work so well. So, you know, at least from a liberal point of view, you know, at least sometimes there's some amount of social services that are sort of 
uh, that need to be positively provided by the government in order to ensure that you have at least the opportunity to act like a person with reason. Um, so that's the first basic argument. Now, from a more negative rights point of view, liberals tend to argue with this. It's my right to do X and therefore nobody should interfere that nobody also includes the government. So this argument, think back to your John Locke, my John Locke lecture, this argument is backed up with the view that a person's body is their property. And so another version of this argument might be something like my body, my choice, right? Uh, very strong, like, look, I own myself. I get to choose what happens to my body. That's an old feminist motto from the 1960s, but it hits at a really core truth of what's going on with Lockean liberalism. My body, my choice. Um, so for example, it's my right to marry whomever I choose and therefore nobody should interfere. So if you're into you know, LGBTQ rights, um, liberalism is a really fast way to get to that goal. Uh, Republicans, you know, I mean, LGBTQ, it's a group. You can definitely justify uh, queer rights through Republican philosophy as well. So don't get hung up thinking, oh, only liberals do this and only Republicans do that. Eh, it's a more complicated story. But for liberals, man, it's a really easy, fast argument. It's like shut, oh, you know, open and shut case, just all done. What else are some things that can come out from this argument? Well, drugs, at least those that aren't highly addictive. And, you know, a highly addictive would maybe violate the sort of reason sort of criteria. But you probably get, whew, excuse me again, you probably get a bigger defense of drugs. So let's look at republicanism, positive form of argument. Um, in order to be a good citizen, it is necessary that the government do blank, fill in the blank. What goes in the blank here? Education. But for Republicans, it certainly does not have to be quite as scientifically focused as for liberals. A little more leeway. Social welfare. I think, yes, even for Republicans, there's a good amount of social welfare that you need to do. People who are hungry or without housing don't make great citizens, okay? So again, Republicans will kind of debate, well, how much, you know, do you really need to ensure people have? Are we making people lazy? Both liberals and Republicans will have sort of that concern, um, yada, yada, yada. So let's continue forward with the Republican. So the negative right version of Republicanism is a little harder to wrap your brain around. So I wrote it up this way. In order to be an independent citizen that can make decisions that identify the common good, it is necessary that the government ensure all persons are, protect, are protected against the arbitrary will of others by doing X. Okay, I know that's a bit longer, but notice the beginning, you know, I could maybe cut out the independent citizen part because I don't focus on that part as much when I lecture, but you know, think about it this way. Like if you are so beholden to somebody that they can basically sort of push you around and tell you how to vote, yada, 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 it's going to make it hard for you to be a good citizen and to vote the way you think people really ought to vote. So imagine this scenario. Your husband, you're married, you're a woman as well. Your husband pays all of the bills and there's no right to divorce. He tells you to vote a certain way or he will cut you off and kick you out. That means, that would mean, this would mean, <laughs> you are subject to his arbitrary will. You have no recourse against him. You can't divorce him, right? So you have no recourse. He can pretty much just tell you what to do and it's arbitrary. In that context, you're not going to be able to make a independent decision that about what you think is the common good. Instead, you're gonna be subject to what he thinks is right and he's gonna force you into behaving a certain way. Okay, so let's look uh, at the Republican view of education, or let's revisit both of these sort of arguments. As stated, liberals put a high emphasis on education, specifically scientific and secular. This is easily derived from the liberal focus on reason. Secondly, for liberals, there's little to zero room for half-truths and national myths. 
things like Thanksgiving, the way we teach it in most schools, are not presented particularly well by most educators. Well here meaning accurate and straight to the facts. Liberals insist that students be given accurate historical and scientific information so they can make a fair and unbiased judgment. Making arguments, education more, we're going to do the Republican side here. You know, of course, Republicans also put a high priority on education, but it's not only scientific in nature. Science plus tradition. More leeway for half-truths and national myths, more leeway for religious, e religious education, uh, distinctly more leeway for religious education. And it's good, you know, and the basic logic here is, look, education is not just about science, but it's also about culture, learning the political traditions of your country. Thanksgiving is a great moral, the moral is sharing, even if it's not 100% accurate. Okay, so, you know, we, the facts aren't exactly straight, but the moral is really good. Sorry, there's a fly bug in me, I hate flies, okay? So, you know, in this case, Republicans are viewing education as not just scientific, but also kind of moral education um, that deals with culture and learning your culture and becoming a part of something. Let's look at another case. Uh, legal and illegal drugs, right? I mean, from a philosophical point of view, legal or illegal doesn't really make that big of a difference. We want to know about uh, other criteria. And then based on that other criteria, should it be legal or not based upon that? Well, okay. So liberals tend to think of the question of drugs as derived from the right of property. My body, my choice. Or I have the right to do drugs and nobody should interfere. Um, I'm sure you guys really like that argument. Uh, <laughs> limited by reason. So drugs that might be highly addictive and would lead, make it difficult for you to participate in normal society. If you're a functional alcoholic, it's probably okay. I mean, maybe not, but you know, notice the language, functional, right? Um, so in this case, cigarettes is definitely a good example. Cigarettes are very highly addictive but you can totally function. They don't particularly interfere with your ability to use reason. You might get a little bit irritated if you can't get a cigarette, like I get that, but they're not gonna lead you to a life of crime, okay? Um, heroin, for example, is highly addictive and very difficult to be a functional, normal person. I mean, maybe, maybe some people do it, but you know, uh, you know high addiction rates, and if you get addicted, you're very likely to turn to other types of crime to feed your addiction, right? That's, that's an important difference between cigarettes and heroin, right? Um, similarly, strong psychedelics like LSD probably violates the reason condition, right? Um, you know, we could work around this for liberals in some sense, but it's hard because if you do hallucinogens, LSD, I mean, you're pretty, I've never done it, but boy, I've seen people do it and you're pretty far out there, uh, you know, and, and, and you're not in your right mind. So that's hard. That's a really hard one for, for liberals to justify. Um, what about alcohol? Well, you know, people don't always make the best decisions when drinking, but at least a moderate amount doesn't seem to interfere with reason. So you know, maybe drinking's okay. On the other hand, if you're a very serious alcoholic, quite frankly, maybe it does violate the reason condition. So, you know, alcohol is not so clear cut as it might seem up front. Um, you probably get marijuana in this analysis. Um, why? Well, marijuana is not as addictive. It's not as addictive as cigarettes. It probably doesn't interfere with the reason. I mean, it's more in this sort of like alcohol sort of level like, well, maybe you might not make great decisions all the time, but done in moderation doesn't seem like, you know, people are just completely losing their, you know, their stuff. So um, if we had strong evidence that, you know, a little bit of marijuana use um, uh, really did make you, you know, what's the stereotype? You're lazy, and you know, yeah. If we had evidence for that, 
you know, maybe that would violate the reason condition. Most of that evidence doesn't really hold up to examination that strongly. So you probably, according to a strictly liberal sort of way of thinking, have the right to at least use a little bit of marijuana. Well, the Republican way of thinking looks at drugs as a question of cultural traditions and citizenship. Does doing the drug make you a bad citizen? Heroin, so in this case, it's pretty similar. Heroin, yes, cigarettes, no, LSD, harder to say. I mean, you know, you obviously shouldn't be doing LSD every day, but if you did it once a year on the weekend, is that really that interfering with your citizenship? That's harder to say in this case. Um, we might have some other tradition where we prefer people to be just more sober. So that's a consideration you might want to put in as well, a kind of preference for not doing too many drugs, things that are going to alter you. Um, but let's take a look at peyote. So peyote is a Native American drug. It's a hallucinogen, very similar to LSD. Um, and the Supreme Court of the United States has actually argued that peyote is allowed to be used by certain groups of Native Americans because it has this cultural significance. Very important, it's part of their tradition, okay? Ah, stinking fly, it's for hate flies, okay? Where it's, and here's where it fits. It's part of actually the coming of age ritual uh, for young men. And so, you know, it's kind of, it's like a quinceanera or sweet 16 or bar or bat mitzvah. When you're gonna become a man, all the young men all go out into the forest with a guide. So it's actually kind of, there's an older guy who's there with them. So, you know, that's kind of an important point here. Um, for liberals, that might actually be very important. Um, uh, you know, and you, I think you drink it, you drink it. It's really hard on your body. You get sick. I mean, it's really bad. And you have a vision quest, a kind of spirit quest, and that's where you get a spirit animal and all of this kind of stuff, okay? So, um, you know, peyote. Well, the Supreme Court, you know, they gave certain uh, Native American groups the right to use peyote in these cultural traditions. The logic being like, look, if we prevent you from doing this, it's actually going to change your culture. I mean, how Jewish would you be if you couldn't do your bar bat mitzvah? Certainly you would still be Jewish, but that's a very strong, big criticism. You know, it's going to really, uh, you know, hinder uh, uh, your ability to practice your religion. Um, you know, I'm not sure liberals would allow peyote. Peyote is pretty rough. Although the fact that the guide is there is pretty important. It's kind of providing a safe context to do it. You know, you have some... Uh, um, someone there who's watching you, a spotter, so to speak, if you're into weightlifting. Um, so, you know, um, if a liberal is going to justify something like peyote or LSD, there's going to be really strong limits on it, right? Age limits, maybe safe spaces. It's definitely, you got to be really careful with these types of things. Um, notice from a Republican point of view, alcohol is a very important part of a lot of our cultural traditions, right? Um, beer is American and also German. Wine is French. I mean, wine in France, right? That goes together like America and apple pie. Um, you know, so, you know, these kinds of things. We even have drinking rituals like your first party. You know, I went to my first party when you're like 17, 18. You have a friend in college or something and he invites you up and you get all excited. Something like that. And, you know, think about marijuana. What's the role that marijuana does play culturally? Specifically think here, California. It's been 20 years that we've had a medicinal marijuana program. Um, you know, uh, the Green Triangle, it's a huge part of our economy. It's a big part of music and other parts of the hippie culture that is so important to California. You know, going back to the 60s, before the hippies, it was the beatniks. and. You know, they did almost any kind of drug they could find, but marijuana was certainly one of them. So, you know, what are you going to say about that? Um, uh, Latinos have been using marijuana in California for a really long time. So, you know, marijuana has been around in California certainly um, for a, a long time. And in the 20th century, maybe it has become a big part of our culture. If that's the case, maybe it's okay to legalize it. Now, notice how that argument sort of really necessitates looking at, well, 
what is actually happening on the ground? What are people actually doing with this? Is this something that is now a valued part of the culture or is it something that people really do look down upon? A lot of people definitely still look down upon doing any drug, right? Marijuana included. Uh, but maybe we've hit this critical mass of people. We don't all have to agree. Maybe we've hit this critical mass of people where, you know, enough sort of marijuana culture is there that uh, it really should be legal. That's how a Republican wants to think about this. Well, what about the environment? Let's look at national, national parks. Well, are you, I think you're probably a better citizen if you get to enjoy the land and beauty of your country. So maybe that's a positive right that it is important for the government to be giving you access to. You know, if you're a liberal, going to the natural parks allows you definitely to get in touch with your reason, you know? I mean, you go, you journal, you like think about stuff, right? But that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would say in this case, these are both really strong arguments. Notice how they emphasize different elements of the question, right? And that's really what we want to be focusing on. What about guns? Well, okay. Uh, remember my Constitution lecture, the Second Amendment is def de definitely more Republican in nature. It's about set collective self-defense more than the individual right to protection. But we can still make the liberal argument, and the liberal argument looks like this. Remember what John Locke said about the state of nature, that each person has the right to execute the law of nature? Well, you have to the right to protect yourself in the state of nature, and if someone breaks in and tries to take your stuff, you get to be the executor of that right. But when you join a government, you give up the right to execute the laws of nature to the government, right? The police are going to be there and do it for you. That's a whole one of the best things about <laughs> a government to John Locke is you don't have to go protect yourself. Someone will, the police will have it be there to do it for you. So at this point, maybe, you know, from a liberal point of view, you don't have the right to own a gun. But the story isn't necessarily that simple. So if you really don't like guns, you might want to end it there. But I don't know if that's quite fair, honestly. You know, what if someone breaks into your house and there's no police officer there to protect you? Aren't you still allowed to protect yourself? The answer here is, of course, yes, right? If the government isn't there to do its appointed job, the right devolves back to you, okay? So maybe the right to own a gun can be justified by the, by the consideration the government isn't always there, and the right to execute the law of nature of self-protection sometimes is just gonna, you know, we can't put a cop in every, in every kitchen, so sometimes I'm gonna have to do these things myself. It's gonna suck, state of nature's not that great, but, you know, I still have the right to defend myself if the government isn't there doing it. Now, having said that, that's true. The question here becomes, I mean, from a liberal point of view, like, that's the argument. There's still a question of whether or not a gun is an essential part of the right to self-preservation, self-protection. It can go either way on this one. I mean, um, you know, yes, you can say yes, a gun is definitely part of it. It's a very useful tool, obviously, for self-protection. Um, on the other hand, if nobody has a gun, if we had a blanket ban on all firearms, well, you wouldn't need a firearm to protect yourself, and something like a big stick would be good enough, or a knife, or a, you know, whatever. I, I, I live in a little bit, not the nicest part of town for a while, and I just kept a little club about like yay long right next to my bed. You know, I had a small little one bedroom apartment. If there's not a lot of space somewhere, your best fighting tool is just that, just bash somebody on the head. I never had to use it, right? I wasn't particularly worried about someone breaking in and stealing my cheap big screen TV. I mean, try to sell this thing on Craigslist, you have 50 bucks, you know, I mean, eh, what are we doing over here, right? Um, but it's not clear. So here's the point though, it's not clear that you absolutely positively need a gun for that right to be effective, right? You can have the right, but it doesn't mean you get absolutely, you know, maybe, you know, you certainly don't have the right to tank, right? So think about that. So do you have that right or not? I don't know, but that's how the liberal thinks about it is, well, if you want to use a liberal right to get to the sort of defense of a, a, a gun and the right to protect myself, this is how you do it. There's a couple stages along the way where you have to say yes to sort of get there. But I mean, fair enough, say yes, right? You wanna get there, that's fine. 
Now, you know, try a few for yourself, right? Let's think about these. Immigration, healthcare, government surveillance, economic inequality, prisons, treatment of animal, water. You know, we could put anything else from our policy papers up here and run them through our little philosophy boxes, okay? So, you know, what about immigration? Well, if we're being liberals, in the first case, it seems like we have a pretty strong natural right to immigrate pretty much wherever you want. It's my body, it's my choice, governments are supposed to respect these rights. So that's a liberal yes. On the other hand, the liberal no looks a little bit more like, well, remember Locke said life, liberties, and estates? Well, so liberties means government. Government in a way, in a Lockean way of thinking, is a kind of collective property. And if somebody comes and wants to use our government, so to speak, they need our consent, okay? So it can get a bit more tricky here with immigration, but you know that's this interesting liberal debate um, that's you know hard to sort of hard to separate out actually. Uh, if you're a smaller Republican and you're thinking about immigration, well, um, you know in the first move it's our government sort of we get to sort of decide how, you know what we want to do, right? Um, it's our group, we decide. So you definitely have this strong like, look in the final analysis, it's our choice. If we don't want to allow somebody in, we don't. We just don't do it. At the same time, and think here very strongly of the United States, one of the arguments people use is we are a nation of immigrants. Well, when they're saying that, what they mean is that um, the United States tradition is one of being open to immigration, that everyone here originally was an immigrant at some point, and that therefore we, in some sense, are obligated to continue that tradition of being open to immigration. Doesn't mean in this case that you would, you know, anyone for any reason, yada, yada, yada. That has never been the case, really. Uh, at the very beginning, we're pretty, pre pretty open to that. Um, but, uh, you know, through time, we started making other types of selections. Um, so, but just keep that in mind, right? Immigration, both of these could go either way. And then think about these other ones, healthcare, government surveillance, economic inequality, you know, prisons, we have a lot of people in prison, yada, 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 yada. Okay, um, hopefully that's helpful for your final exam.